This is Capel Kellen in the Trewellyn Valley in Wales, and it's one of the last remaining Welsh-speaking communities. It's small, home to around 70 people, but there's a local shop and post office, a school and a chapel where community events are regularly held. There's nothing especially unique about Capel Kellen. It's just another rural Welsh village. But 40 miles away, just across the border in England, a plot is underway to erase this village from the map. The tiny village of Capel Kellen in North Wales nears the end of its centuries of history. We don't exist. We're annihilated. It's just a ruthless activity, really. Today, you can look up Capel Kellen and you'll get a result. But the village and its inhabitants, they're all gone. And instead, what you'll find is this. By 1965, the families of Capel Kellen were evicted and the village was drowned and replaced with a two and a half mile long reservoir. Every home was demolished. There was no remains whatsoever of any whole household. Every tree was cut down. I thought Wales will never allow this to happen. You know, we realised then that we have no powers in Wales at all and we lost everything. When England decided to flood this quiet valley, nobody could have predicted what was about to unfold. Bomb was found behind this plaque here. It woke the people up to what's happening to the country. Where they took the land from us, I don't like that at all. It is rather anachronistic and out of place. This was the turning point. Something needed to be done, so we decided to take drastic action. Perhaps on the lines of the IRA in Ireland. That explosion reverberated in the end through Wales. So I want to figure out why England was able to get away with drowning this Welsh village and speak with people who saw it all happen to understand how it reshaped Welsh nationalism and whether something like this could ever happen again. So I was really going into this with nothing. I'd never heard of Capel Kellen and what had happened there. I just found a post on Reddit and proceeded to tell everybody that I ran into for the next week about it. And turns out they also had never heard of this story. So I was like, okay, obviously I need to speak to some people from Wales. And when you tell them this story, they're like, yeah, of course we know about this. It is the subject of a great controversy in Wales. It's seen as a turning point in modern Welsh history and a defining moment, really, in the emergence of modern Wales. So in England, it's, it's perhaps seen as not quite so important is that it's important at all, I'm, I'm probably suggest. So I started to find out everything I could about this place. The village was tucked away here in the valleys of North Wales. It was surrounded by mountains and farmlands. From what I've read, it was a close community with homes that had been passed down through families for centuries. During the early 20th century, in a rapidly changing world, in a country that was dealing with a decline in its language and culture, Kellen seemed immune from outside forces. The residents were deeply connected to the landscape and they relied on it for work and wrote poetry about their love for it. Children would play in the valley next to the river Trewellyn that ran through it. The local school and chapel were used regularly for social events after hours and it just looked like a happy community that was frozen in time, unaffected by influences from the outside world. So that's what I've been able to piece together from all this research. None of it gives me any first-hand accounts or what it's like to actually lose your home. So I really want to speak to some people that actually lived here. And the problem with that is this was back in the 1960s and a lot of the elder residents are not around anymore. And the ones that probably are were kids at the time. And I have no idea how you get hold of people who lived in a rural village in the 1960s. So I've got my work cut out. But these documents do give us a motive to why Capel Kellen was flooded. And to understand that, we need to look over here to a city in England. Liverpool, a city of nearly a million inhabitants. During the war, it was a target for air raids which laid waste whole areas. Liverpool is still recovering from the bombings of the Second World War. Besides London, Liverpool is the most heavily bombed city in the country. 
It's home to the Albert Docks, one of the largest ports in the UK, which was vital during the war. But in the aftermath, manufacturing and troops are no longer needed, and the port is falling into disrepair. Liverpool is also running out of space to house its residents. In the past 100 years, its population grew by more than 120%. Now, in 1951, there was around 760,000 people living here, and a vast majority are living in slums in the centre of the city. A street like this is home to around 900 people, with families packed together into single rooms. All these factors lead to a rise in poverty across the city. It's battered, it's bankrupt. Large swathes of the city are derelict due to the bombings. The Liverpool City Council wants to undertake a housing construction programme, which will involve clearing the slums and putting people into better housing. By March, the Liverpool Council, known at this point as the Corporation of Liverpool, is raising alarm bells, claiming that the existing water supply is about to run out. According to this transcript from a House of Lords debate, the average daily demand for water across the city was 65 million gallons. The only way the city is able to meet this demand is by overdrawing the reservoirs and by obtaining temporary supplies from nearby Manchester. But despite this cry for help, the Corporation of Liverpool has already come up with a plan to provide water to its population. They want to take it from across the border in Wales. And they know it'll work because they've done it before. In the late 1880s, Lake Vernwy was built by the Liverpool Corporation Waterworks Committee as a reservoir that could hold more than 10 billion gallons of water. In doing so, the reservoir submerged the rural settlement of Llanowen, and the water travelled 68 miles along the pipelines to the people of Liverpool. But 75 years later, Liverpool still doesn't have enough water, and once again, they're looking across the border for the answer. North Wales is close by and rich with water coming off the mountains, so they send surveyors to the area near the town of Bala to find somewhere that might be suitable for a new reservoir. Okay, I just booked a room in Bala, which is the closest town to where Capel Kellen was. This region of Wales is like super remote, so I'm gonna base myself here and I'm hoping there'll be people there that I can speak to because I've spent the past few days emailing publishers, researchers, journalists, people on Facebook, basically anybody who has ever written or mentioned about Capel Kellen, just hoping for a lead. But I got nothing, so I had to think of a new approach. Capel Kellen was in the Aruri National Park. You might also know it as Snowdonia. Around half a million people visit here each year. So I thought that maybe the people that work in the National Park might know about the history of the village and have some connections to the people that live there. So I gave them a call and I was being transferred to the press office when the line went dead. But I found an email for the person I was being connected to, shot them a message, and eight minutes later, I got a response and a lead. Hi Andy, thanks for your email. Sounds interesting. The best person to speak to would be the local councillor from Bala, Elwyn Edwards, who has great knowledge of the area's history. Contact details can be found here. So I gave Elwyn a call and he answered and told me to ring him back in a few days time and he would find some people who had grown up in the village. Okay, I'm calling Elwyn Edwards, who said he might be able to help me. Should I? Hi, Elwyn. Uh, it's Andy Burgess. I'm the person making the documentary around Capel Kellen. All right, it's okay. How well, it... I've got some phone numbers for you. Oh, fantastic. That's amazing. So a few days later, I was making the long journey to North Wales. And after a few more cold calls where I dropped Elwyn's name into the mix, I had managed to arrange to meet up with two people who went to school in Capel Kellen and to this day live on the land that was partially flooded. On a personal note, I've become pretty interested with Welsh history and culture over the last year, mainly because I'm a quarter Welsh. Now, I've always kind of known this, but it wasn't until I was able to confirm this by using my heritage. And they are also the sponsor of this video. Their site puts over 19 billion historical documents and records at your fingertips. My Heritage is the number one family history service. It's so simple and easy to build your family tree and discover your origins, and you might also find some new relatives. 
So it allowed me to dig deeper into my granddad's Welsh heritage. He wasn't born in Wales, which was why when I was growing up, I never had a really strong connection to Wales, but his parents did, which led me to look over a bunch of Welsh maps like these ones to see where they came from. My heritage also has this cool family tree feature called Instant Discoveries, which shows you family members that my heritage has found for you. And it allows you to add an entire branch to your family tree at just a click of a button. They also have these cool tools that allow you to take old images and bring them to life. Here's a photo of my great granddad, the Welsh one. And with a few clicks, I can just repair and colorize this image. It's pretty cool. If you're also interested in learning more about your family history, you can sign up for a 14 day free trial at the link below and enjoy all the features that my heritage has to offer. Okay, let's now get back to this story of how England was able to flood a Welsh village. It's coming up. I can see it on the map. I've got like goosebumps. Like the hairs on the back of my neck have stood up. I've just like so much history in this place that I've been pouring over for a while now. And I'm about to see it. Whoa, okay, here it is. Let's follow it around. This is, was Capel Keller now just Lake Keller, and it's beautiful. But none of this was here, and below these waters is a village. It's just like such an eerie thought that so much happened here over a 10 year period that just had a huge impact on where Wells is today. It was a very tiny village, just a couple of houses, two or three houses in the village itself. You know, every social event that took place in the evenings would either be in the school, but uh, more often than not in, in the chapel. This is Aaron Pressel Jones. His farm now overlooks the lake, but as a kid, he grew up in Capel Kellen. We used to live right in the hollow next to the chapel. We live now on the remains of my grandfather's farm. That was all uh, house buildings and land of 20 odd acres that was flooded. The Liverpool Corporation are opening new wash houses. This one will cater for hundreds of customers when it's finished. The machines will be more up to date with plenty of hot water. The Corporation of Liverpool has received the geological surveys back and concluded that the Trewellyn Valley has everything they need, with an abundance of water due to the high rainfall from the surrounding mountains and being geographically close to Liverpool, this means that the water can easily travel down the River Dee and on to Liverpool. The valley itself is also a perfect U-shape, meaning it's ideal for holding a large body of water. There's plenty of empty valleys across Wales that could be suitable, but it would cost more. And in their survey, they also discovered the area had plenty of soil, rock, and clay, which could be used for the construction of a dam and would drastically bring down the cost of bringing in materials. The only issue left is the valley's residents, but the corporation know that they could approve this project without any permission from the Welsh and decided to hold off from telling the residents their fate for as long as possible. On the morning of December 2nd, 1955, three days before Christmas, Aaron Pressel Jones's father is reading this copy of the North Wales Weekly News. And hidden away on page 10, unknown to anybody in the community before today, was a small article stating that Liverpool Corporation had a new plan to build a 16 million pound dam in the valley where they live to service the people of Liverpool. Ever since Liverpool Corporation announced in 1955 that they were going to build a dam here to form a reservoir to provide water for their city, there have been letters to the papers, petitions, protests and national conferences to protest about the flooding of this part of Wales. We lost everything when, when they did this. I went to visit Elwyn Edwards at his home and he also has a strong relationship to this place. Where the dam is now, there was a road going underneath the dam through the village and my Grandfather's house was the nearest to the dam. It was in a turnpike, very old house. And when I contacted him, I knew his name was familiar because I'd seen it before in this famous photo of a protest on the streets of Liverpool in November 56. 
In response to the plan, thousands of people protest in nearby Bala, but Liverpool didn't take any notice. So almost a year after the residents of Kellin discover their homes were to be flooded, they decide to take two buses to Liverpool and peacefully protest through the streets towards the main council building. What do you remember about that trip? What stuck in my mind, there were a few women shouting at us and they weren't very kind. Otherwise, it was just okay. You made the decision yourself to go to Kellin to then go to Liverpool. Yeah. Did you, you didn't go with your family? No, they didn't come with me, just myself. The drowning of this valley turned me to Repu a Welsh Republican. Definitely. My father was a socialist labour man. We had many a quarrel in the house. And he came round to the idea of no Wales need to own governments after the drowning here. And everything changed. The protests here also achieve nothing. In fact, most Liverpoolians have no idea what is going on in Kellen because it's not being reported in the local newspapers. So right now you're probably wondering how did they even get away with this? Just propose to build a massive reservoir in the middle of a Welsh community without telling them with no approval from the Welsh authorities or the Welsh government. To start with that last point, there wasn't a Welsh government. And we should just take a step back for a minute and look at the wider picture to understand what the relationship was like in the 50s between England and Wales. The UK was in a post-war era. The country and the world had united in order to defeat fascism. At the same time, a small nationalist movement in Wales is starting to gain more popularity. It's called Plaid Cymru, and President Gwynfer Evans found a strong irony in the fact that Welsh men and women were going off to fight for Britain and help free nations across Europe. While their own nation, Wales, is seen as being in some way subjugated by the UK state. So there's this escalating feeling, it's slow, but nonetheless is an increasing sense of Welsh consciousness. Okay, so this is a very, very abbreviated history behind the nationalist movement. The United Kingdom is made up of four countries, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. In the 13th century, the Prince of Wales, Llewellyn II, and then his brother were killed by the English monarchy. The King of England, Edward I, then invaded Wales and claimed the territory as part of his own. To establish control over the region, each English monarch moving forward gave their successor the title the Prince of Wales, which continues to this day. Now that Prince Charles is King Charles, his son, William, Harry, 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 William, that one, is now the new Prince of Wales because he is the successor to Prince to King Charles. Anyway, this is going to come back into play later. Wales then officially became part of the United Kingdom in the 16th century under the Law in Wales Act, which incorporated Wales into the Kingdom of England. So bring this back to 1955 when Liverpool, an English city, announced it was going to flood the Trewellyn Valley in Wales. Welsh nationalists saw this as another invasion on their land. And the response in Wales was, we need to unite against this. My Lord, and members of the House of Commons. I am very it comes down to a crucial vote on the 3rd of July in Parliament, where Welsh ministers put forward a case for rejection of the bill, as it would involve flooding more than 800 acres of farmland, which means 16 farms would be drowned and the village completely submerged underwater. Of the 36 Welsh representatives, 35 of them vote against the bill, but the Welsh voice is ignored and the bill is passed by 166 votes to 117, due to the majority of English members of parliament wanting to back an English policy. Besides it being a numbers game where England always has the majority of ministers to win votes, Wales has always felt like an underdog, and England has known this going back centuries, which is why Liverpool Corporation know that they can just do this. But they now legally have the votes, and the plan moves forward. Liverpool says it will take them eight years to complete the build of a two and a half long mile reservoir. It's going to be 40 meters deep and will hold upwards of 71 million cubic meters of water. And by then, the village of Capelkellen and the surrounding areas will be gone. So the actual land itself was bought on agricultural value. Might have looked a good price at the time. Good or bad, really, whether you're happy or not with the price. It was pointless doing any hassle because as soon as you put any hassle to the argument, they could put you with a compulsory purchase order. But uh, if you knew what they were going to get, 
from that agricultural land to build the dam, it was a bloody cheap. Over the next few years, the construction work starts. The land is stripped for materials and the valley starts to become unrecognisable. There are so many vehicles and um, cranes and what have you, day and night. This was like a crater, really. If you hadn't seen the valley before, you'd swear you were on the moon. It's now October at the school in Kellen, and this is the last day before it would close forever. Over the following months, one by one, residents reluctantly start to leave their homes as caravans arrive to house the growing number of workers on the site. The following year, the church and the rest of the village are scheduled to be demolished. Campaigning against the destruction of Kapil Kellen over the past eight years seems to have failed. But there were some that felt that the resistance from the locals and the Welsh Nationalist Party hadn't gone far enough, and that it was time for more radical action that would change the trajectory of Wales forever. Nationalist seems to have been centred on this new £20 million dam at Trewerin in North Wales. But then these protests took a new turn. On the 10th of February, John Albert Jones, a former policeman in the Royal Air Force, Emir Llewellyn Jones, a university student, and Owen Williams break into the dam's construction site under the cover of darkness and are carrying an explosive. It's the middle of winter and the valley is covered in snow so deep that they've got their car stuck and have no choice but to continue on foot. The plan was to break onto the site without being detected by the night guards and plan to bomb on a transformer that gave power to the rest of the site. At 3am there is an explosion that is heard across the valley and work on the site comes to a standstill. And it turns out that I'm also about to break some trespassing rules. Today, the site is again under construction, and I've met up with Arthur Morris Roberts, who went to school in Kellen, and we're heading towards the spot where the bomb went off. I don't see quite a small school, but there are bloody barriers here. Is this where it was? I know that the security is the other side down. Oh, I see. What the come on, old. Oh, uh, okay, can we come this way? Yeah, sure. I guess we're going. That's right. Did not think I would be breaking an entry with a elderly man. Will they mind that we've come through here? No, I don't think so. They, they'll, you know, just one off and we're not interfering with anybody anyway. The transformer was over here. And that's where they blew that one, uh, blew the bottom of the oil came out of it. Yeah. And it was the middle of winter? Yeah, in the snow. And they got stuck and walked back all the way and they got to the little van and they were trying to escape and they got stuck in the snow. We'd heard that the Phoenix boss in Kerry. I was friendly with a, a friend, we were in school together. We used to meet every Sunday morning, about 10 o'clock. And he came to Station View and said, it's funny, they pushed the car out, out of the snow. He said, he got stuck in the snow. And I think they were lying to me, he said. This fella tried to put an, an, an English accent, but he was Welsh. So I pushed the car out of the snow for them to turn back. Where they came from, they couldn't go forward to the snow. The three men get away, but it's quickly apparent that they're not professionals. And the boy that helped them get the car out of the snow is soon questioned by the police, which leads to the discovery of the car. And Emma Llewellyn Jones and Owen Williams are both jailed for 12 months. John Albert Jones avoids a prison sentence, probably because of his history with the Royal Air Force, and instead receives a three year probation. And I've managed to contact one of those people. And after a lot of back and forth, he's willing to speak to me. He lives about an hour from here. So tomorrow I'm gonna to head down there and speak to him and ask him how we went from peaceful protests to planting bombs. The news of the explosion spreads across Wales with mixed reactions. A lot of people feel like it's a step too far. Wales is a peaceful nation, but in private, in conversations in the pub between friends, some feel like at least someone is doing something. But whatever the purpose of the explosion for Capel Kellen was, it has little effect. And soon the site is back up in operation. And Capel Kellen is inevitably going to be drowned. 
They are dismantling the school, they're shutting the post office, the chapel is scheduled for demolition. They are removing graves, digging up bodies and moving graves. Every home was demolished and uh, there was no uh, remains whatsoever of any whole household. Every tree was cut down. It was a very, very um, ruthless activity, really. Uh, there was no care of wildlife and very little respect to anything that was in the valley prior. Can you show me where the village was? Yeah, the village would be sort of halfway between that point and this point, right in the middle there. This is what the Truellen Valley now looks like, a vast bowl ready to be flooded. Representatives from Liverpool have been visiting to check on the progress, but an opening ceremony they have planned to commence the flooding in this valley shows how oblivious they are to the controversy surrounding the project. And there's people there protesting, and I, I saw this man lifting up half a brick and cut the microphone wires. The ceremony is over within minutes, and the largest protest against a reservoir is now taking place, and in some instances turning violent. But it all comes just too late. The water has been released into the reservoir, and the village is gone. When the dam was completed, they said it would take three years to fill, but we had a very, very wet back end, and I'd say within nine or ten months it was full to the brim. When the reservoir was flooded, there were people at the ceremony in military uniforms. There have been rumours for some time of a new militant movement. And Welsh nationalism was about to enter a new era. They took the land from us. I don't like that at all. But why do you think it's necessary to use explosives to damage, to fight, in other words? Because what sort of people belong to it? Highly intelligent people, doctors, professors. Would you be prepared to fight in that way, like the IRA? Yes, I would. Doctors and professors really know about blowing up dams or pylons? Wales is a country, and it wants its water boards, it wants its rights. It was an era of violence, an era of militant action. And the person I'm visiting right now, he wasn't involved, as far as I'm aware, in what came afterwards. He was in prison when this started off, but maybe his actions, maybe that triggered something in other people to take more radical roots. I started making contacts with people who had similar views, and we decided we'd have to do something about what was happening in Schwerin. This is Owen Williams. He was one of the three men who planted the explosive at the reservoir in 1963. I wanted to speak to him, not just to hear about why they did it, but to figure out how that event influenced others to take a more radical action for independence. We lived in a different world. Our Wales was different. It was in the part of this place called Britain. My mother brought me a book called Owen Glyndwr, who was the Welsh leader in the 15th century who fought and overthrew English rule in Wales. And he influenced me a lot. I became political at nine years old. I actually thought that the action of being so drastic to plant a bomb would wake up the sleeping Welsh nation. They had been in slumber for centuries, since Owen Glyndwr, really. And of course, Welsh was, became non-conformist, which is the turn the other cheek sort of thing, and they didn't fight back. And uh, we felt this time to hit back. When we set up in uh, the underground movement, was called MAC. That was Media the Miffin Company, Movement for the Defence of Wales, MAC. In the same year, a separate paramilitary group was also set up. Join the Welsh Freedom Army. Companies are being formed in your area now. The Free Wales Army made their first public appearance at that failed opening ceremony. These were the people wearing homemade military uniforms, and they started to gain wider recognition, in part due to their charismatic leader and his claims of having a large supply of weapons and around 2,000 members across Wales. And it engages the, the national and the international media with great effect, it has to be said. But the police and the media never really took them as a serious threat. 
and they claim to be undertaking maneuvers in the Welsh hills, ready to fight the English sort of military as it comes over the board. It's all very emotive. It's almost entirely exaggerated. It's effective in the sense that it captures the headlines, but how effective is it in readers across the world taking Welsh nationalism seriously? So out of the drowning of Capelkelon emerged these two groups, the Free Wales Army, who captured the headlines but were essentially all talk, and then you had Owen Williams' underground group, MAC, who had actually followed through on their plans to use force to try and make a change, and were now serving time in prison because of it. And back in England, the big takeaway from this 10-year project to drown a village and extract water from Wales to Liverpool that was opposed on all fronts in Wales, the big takeaway was that they could do this again and still get away with it. But now there was a faction of Welsh nationalism that was looking to fight back. It was revived a few years later by John Jenkins, who was uh, in the British Army and he took it a step further. In Mid-Wells, another reservoir is being constructed in the Llewendog Valley. Like Trewellyn, its goal is to provide water to England, this time to the people in the West Midlands. And again, there are protests and objections like before, but again, nothing is working, and like before, the Mac boys are involved. There's another explosion on the construction site of the dam. This time, it sets the work back by months and causes tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage. It's the first act of political violence since the events in Trewellyn, and this really marks the start of a new era of radical nationalism in Wales. Between 1966 and 1969, Mac blow up multiple pipelines carrying water to England. They, they bombed also the tax office in Cardiff, they bombed the Welsh office and the Royal Mint. According to Jenkins, their intention isn't to hurt people, but just to cause damage. But that was all about to change. Their next target is the investiture of Prince Charles as the Prince of Wales. God bless the Prince of Wales, they say. Those mighty Welsh voices bore the message of the people who were to welcome Prince Charles as their own. This appointment divides the country, with many welcoming the young prince, but it's also met with a ton of opposition because of its history. For me, it, it, it's a, a way of officially dedicating one's life, or, or part of one's life, to Wales. The bomb was found behind this plaque here, which commemorates the first visit to Wales by Prince Charles and uh, the Welsh people, after all, wanted it. It's even nothing to do with Wales whatsoever. Our princes were murdered. The Mac boys have placed four bombs around the town of Carnarvon, where the investiture is taking place. The night before, two members are killed when one of them goes off prematurely. The second on the day of the investiture is in a local policeman's garden, and the third and fourth fail to detonate. But one is left undiscovered for several days until it seriously injures a 10-year-old boy who finds it. Later that year, Jenkins is arrested and sentenced for 10 years in prison. A number of bombings would continue sporadically throughout the following decade. But there's no evidence that anything that transpired after 1969 was linked to Mac. Owen Williams claims to have had no involvement in the Jenkins era of the Mac Boys, but I wanted to know how he felt about the legacy of the group he founded. How do you feel about those acts they took? Do you think that there was more chance there of perhaps people being hurt? Well, obviously, this you can't say 100% nobody's going to get hurt, like they say, you know. You say cliche, you cross the road, you know, I've got it alive and alive on the other side. You have no way of saying that. Accidents can happen, we know that, but measures were taken to ensure that hopefully they didn't happen. So in hindsight, do you think there was another way you would have tackled it, or do you think that was probably the best way to do it? That was the best way, I think so, yeah. People will disagree with me, naturally. They have the right to disagree with me, but um, I've given a lot of thought, and I don't, I don't think so. I don't think we would be even where we are now, but if that hadn't happened, I really believe that. I can't agree with Wales at all. I think they went a little bit too far doing that, because, you know, there was no point. You know, pity they got um, lengthy time of jail, but they shouldn't have done it, but they could have drawn attention in other ways anyway. But nothing came of it. It's coming now through the Pike Cymru and working with the Labour Party, because they haven't got the majority. 
Wales after 22 results. And it's going to be yes by 559,419. So after all that, Wales will have an assembly. Support in Wales to have more control over its nation continued to rise in the 80s and 90s. In 1997, the country votes in favour of Welsh devolution, essentially meaning the decentralisation of power from London to Wales. This establishes a Welsh parliament in Cardiff and gives them powers to make laws in areas like agriculture, education and housing. Over the following years, more powers would be passed to Wales from the UK government. But from what I can gather, there is an opinion that what happened here, beneath this lake, is what woke the people of Wales up to the disparity between the two nations. So the lead toward devolution in the 90s, do yeah. you think this was the catalyst? Yes. There's a lot of talks about that. If you didn't know what had happened here, this might be a dream for a lot of people to wake up to each morning. But Aaron grew up with a very different view, and I was curious how it felt for him all these years later. So that's the view I've got every morning when I get up, looking out onto onto the village. Yeah, that's so really... The, the village was right there. Yeah, yeah. You come accustomed to it really, but I'd, I'd rather look at it um, full, that path full. What Aaron's talking about is a period during some very hot and dry summer months where the remains of the village once again become visible. When this happens, this is about the only time Capel Kellen is referenced in English media, and huge groups of tourists come to visit. So much so that a local councillor and chaired bard, Elwyn Edwards, has made a plea for commemorative plaques to be put up. When it goes down to a certain level, you can attribute it to something you remember when you were a kid. It affected my, um, my parents quite a lot, really, especially my mother. Uh, see where them birds are flapping their wings there now. Sort of down in the hollow there, that's where my grandfather's place used to be. But there's one final twist in this story. In Liverpool's 1955 plan, they stated that they needed the water to keep up with the demand to support a growing population. But throughout this 10-year project, there was a major change to the city. By 1965, when the water was flowing to Liverpool, Liverpool's population had decreased and they didn't actually need all that water. What gets to me is they, they've been selling the water for years and years. Not only the water from Kellin, there are valleys have been there on the swell, and the water from there goes for nothing over the border to England as well. We get nothing for it. Some people say that they already knew this, that they were just going to then sell it on. They put them very well out of it. And once they've done well out of it, they didn't want it then. The water is now controlled by Wells Water, and in 2005, on the 40th anniversary, Liverpool issued an official apology for the flooding. Water is a commodity that everybody needs. According to WWF, around 1.1 billion people in the world don't have access to clean water. And the impacts of climate change is making water scarcity worse. So it's hard to imagine that there won't be a situation in the future across the world where more land will need to be flooded to supply water to those in need. Drowning all this opens the eyes of a lot of people. Yeah, they tried in uh, a lot of other countries. But I guess the question should be, is it being done to service a community? Is the water actually going to help the people who need it? And at what cost? Should the people in one community lose their homes and livelihoods to provide water to people in another? I think there is no doubt that everybody should have access to clean drinking water. But the story of Capel Kellen was the biggest example in the 20th century of England's dominance over Wales. I'd love to end this by saying that the drowning of Trewellyn changed the English perspective on water or something along those lines, but really it's an example of the imbalance of political powers which we still see playing out across the world today. And in a country that is known for getting plenty of rain, we still seem to take water for granted.
really quickly, just before you go, if you want to see how I actually made this video, there was a lot of stuff that I did differently. It was a really interesting video to report on and edit. All of that, the behind the scenes, like the DVD extras of this movie as they would have been in the 2000s, you can find all that on Patreon, along with director commentaries of previous videos. If you're interested in that, check it out at patreon.com slash faultline. You can pay what you want. There's four different tiers, but every tier gets the same thing. That's the spiel. If you're interested, check it out. And if you're also interested in learning more about your family history, you can check out the link to my heritage in the description below for a 14 day free trial. And if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe, consider that, and I'll be back soon with another video.